much, Terry, and welcome to you all tonight for our wonderful ICEP lecture series event. The word soul is given several meanings in Webster's Dictionary. We might use the word in a religious sense, a, a broader spiritual sense, or even to describe great jazz or food. But what exactly is soul? That's the question tonight's speaker grapples with. Dr. Nancy Murphy is professor of Christian philosophy at Fuller Theological Seminary in Pasadena, California. She received a BA from Creighton University, a PhD from UC Berkeley, and her Doctor of Theology degree from the Graduate Theological Union. Her research interests focus on the role of modern and postmodern philosophy in shaping Christian theology and on relations between theology and science. Dr. Murphy has served on several boards, including the Center for Theology and Natural Sciences. She is an ordained minister in the Church of the Brethren and is married to theologian James William McClendon, Jr. Also, she has written many books, including the one her talk is named after, Whatever Happened to Soul, a scientific and theological portrait of human nature, a book that deals with the resonance between modern science and Christian faith. To discuss Whatever Happened to Soul, please help me welcome Dr. Nancy Murphy. Okay, am I on? Yes, I'm on. Great. Well, thank you for that introduction. And I want to take a minute to say a special thanks to Terry Bristol for inviting me to be here and for doing a huge amount of organizational and legwork to make this uh, very exciting a visit to this part of the country. I hadn't been here before, so it's a delight for me to get to visit your city and see some of the countryside, and uh, I'm glad to know that the sun really does come out sometimes. <laughs> There's one thing that I hate about public speaking. I know that when you're um, giving a public address of this sort, you're supposed to start out with a joke of some sort to get your audience's attention. And uh, one of the things that philosophers have in common, of which I am one, is we are constitutionally lacking in a sense of humor. <laughs> and uh, so I complained about this fact when I was uh, lecturing in Cambridge one summer, and uh, several of the folks in the audience kindly offered to send me materials that I could use on my next occasion. And they sent me stacks of stuff, and I dutifully read through all of it, but. You know, it wasn't funny. <laughs> However, being a professor, I know that there is one sure way to get an audience's attention, and that is to announce a pop quiz. <laughs> now, the good news is you're not going to have to turn this in. I know you've paid a great deal of money to get your tickets, but nonetheless, you haven't paid nearly enough to get a grade for this. And so I'm going to read through the quiz, and then um, after I've given you a chance to think about your answers, what I'm going to do is simply ask for a show of hands to see which answers you have chosen. So here's the question. Which of the following comes closest to your view of human nature? Option number one. Humans are composed of one part, a physical body. This is a view that could be called materialism or physicalism. Option number two, humans are composed of two parts. And this is a view called dualism. There are actually two possibilities here, 2A, humans are composed of a body and a soul, or 2B, humans are composed of a body and a mind. Third option, humans are composed of three parts, for example, a body, a mind, and a spirit. This view is referred to as trichotomism. And you've got a fourth option, an out. This question doesn't make any sense. All right, now I can't see you very well, but 
how many of you would uh, associate yourself with view number one? How many physicalists have we got out here? Not very many, all right. How many dualists do we have? Dualists in general. Okay, a few. How many trichotomists do we have? Oh, quite a lot. And how many of you would choose option number four? <laughs> good, good. Now, I've tried giving this quiz in a number of different settings. I've tried it in a graduate psychology course at my institution. Uh, I've tried it in a, an advanced biology class in university, and I've just tried it out on random groups of people whenever I can corral them long enough to get them to listen. And the interesting thing is that while the proportions differ, every time I ask, I get a spread across all of the options. Our culture uh, apparently harbors physicalists, dualists, and trichotomists in varying numbers, but I've never seen a single group of people that agreed on the answer to this question. Now, it's an important issue. It has consequences, for instance, for ethical debate. Suppose we're having a debate about uh, the ethics of abortion and one party says, well, I think that abortion is immoral because the fetus has a soul from the moment of conception on. And somebody on the other side of the room says, soul? What do you mean by soul? People don't have souls. And so you can see that this is a, a difference of opinion about a fairly abstract sort of matter, but it's one that has very concrete sorts of applications. And as I'll, I will point out later, one of the points where differences of this sort make a difference is what you can get away with saying at funerals. And I'll also suggest at the end that it has consequences for the way we live our own lives um, in the here and now. So I think it's really strange that there's been so little discussion of these differences. I think of this as a huge underground controversy most of us don't even know what the people closest to us think on this issue. Actually, I would bet that a lot of you don't even know what your spouses think. Unbeknownst to you, you could be sleeping with a trichotomist. <laughs> Consider that. My plan tonight is to deal with two topics. The first one is to provide a partial answer to the question, how did we in our Western culture come to be so divided on this issue? And in order to address that question, I'm going to look at some of the history of Western thought, and then I'm also going to turn to contemporary neuroscience. The second question I want to address is, should religious people be concerned about how this controversy comes out? And now I have to apologize for the fact that I'll be speaking primarily from a Christian viewpoint. I'll also have a little bit to say about Jewish views on these matters, uh, but I won't be able to address uh, how these issues look from others of the major world religions. It's not that I think that those religious perspectives are unimportant, it's just that uh, the only tradition that I really know anything about is my own Christian tradition. And I've discovered it's a pretty good rule of thumb not to say a whole lot about a subject that you know nothing about. So my first topic, how did we all come to be so divided on this issue? The short answer is that both the Western philosophical tradition and also the most influential religions in the West have been dualist throughout most of their histories. However, contemporary neuroscience suggests a physicalist account of the person. So I will survey some of our dualist history, and then I'm going to look specifically at why the neurosciences now incline many folks to move in the direction of a physicalist account of the person. But the largest percentage of you here, at least those of you who are willing to answer, are trichotomists. And so I'll say, <laughs> I'll say just a little bit about what I know of where that view came from. Um, I was actually, I, I'm surprised tonight, and I've been surprised on other occasions to find that this is such a widely held view, uh, mainly because I don't really know where it comes from. 
Apparently, the source for many who hold this view is Christian scripture, but the biblical scholars tell me that it can be traced only to one particular text in the New Testament. And this is in the first letter to the Thessalonians, chapter 5, verse 23. This is a benediction or blessing uh, from Paul. May the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, it's not clear to me why this one particular text could have had such a widespread influence, but uh, it's been suggested that it was taken as a basis for teaching about human nature by one very influential Korean pastor by the name of Watchman Nee. I haven't been able to uh, trace back that history, and so I haven't been able to verify that claim. Dualism, though, it's much more, uh, it's much easier to trace where dualism comes from in our culture. You are probably thinking, some of you, that of course it comes from Christianity and therefore it ultimately comes from the Christian's Jewish predecessors. Now, it's quite true that most Christians throughout most of their history have in fact been dualists. And so didn't they get their view from the Hebrew scriptures, that is what Christians call the Old Testament. Aren't these scriptures in fact filled with references to the soul? Here are some very familiar passages from the Psalms. Psalm 16, for thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. Psalm 25, oh, keep my soul and deliver me. Let me not be ashamed. Psalm 26, gather not my soul with sinners. Psalm 49, they that trust in their wealth, like sheep, they are laid in the grave. Death shall feed on them. But God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave, for he shall receive me. Now, these passages fit nicely with the view that while the body may decay in the grave, God saves souls. It sounds exactly like body-soul dualism. However, there are a lot of other references to the soul in the Old Testament that don't fit this dualist picture at all. Here's Psalm 7. O Lord my God, in thee do I put my trust. Save me from all them that persecute me, lest he tear my soul like a lion, rending it in pieces. Psalm 22. Deliver my soul from the sword. Psalm 35. Without cause have they hid for me their net in a pit, which without cause they have digged for my soul. So this doesn't sound right, does it? Souls are not capable of being torn or stabbed, and it's bodies that people throw into pits. So what's going on here? Well, it's pretty widely agreed these days that what we're seeing in the Hebrew scriptures as body-soul dualism is actually an illusion created by earlier translators. The Hebrew word translated soul in all of these cases is the word nephesh. But nephesh doesn't really mean what later Christians have meant by the word soul. In most of these cases, it's simply a way of referring to the whole living person. Here's how more recent versions translate some of those same passages. Psalm 16, in the King James Version, from which I was originally reading, says, O oh, keep my soul and deliver me, let me not be ashamed. The New International Version says, Guard my life and rescue me, let me not be put to shame. Psalm 25, King James, O oh, keep my soul and, oops, um, Psalm 16, for thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, New International Version, because you will not abandon me to the grave. So the Hebrew word nephesh is translated now in some cases as person or life 
In many instances, it's simply used as a way to refer to the person's own self. It's used reflexively. It's also, very interestingly, used of animals. And here it's best translated as living being. So those of us who have seen body-soul dualism in the Old Testament, including many of the earlier translators, have been reading it back into the texts, not getting it out of the texts. So we have to remember that every time we translate a text, especially from a language that is uh, distant in origins from the other, we're actually doing a process of interpretation. The next question then is, where do, what does the New Testament teach about body-soul dualism versus physicalism? This is a more difficult question, but I believe the best answer is nothing. Let me explain what I mean. There are a number of issues on which the Bible has clear teachings. There are other things that the Bible says in order to put forward those teachings. For example, when the prophet Isaiah says that God will gather Israel and Judah from the four corners of the earth, he doesn't mean to teach that the earth has four corners. That's a conception of geography and geology that he simply assumed in making his prophecy. I believe that the New Testament has a lot to teach us about what it means to be human, but it does not mean to teach us specific details about how many parts we're made of, body and soul, or body, soul, and spirit, or just one. Just as in our own day, there were, in the New Testament times, a variety of ideas about the makeup of the person. The various New Testament authors used different accounts of the person in order to make clear their teachings on other matters. So, if we, got, we try to go through the New Testament to see what it teaches on this subject, we'll end up frustrated and confused. Some of my colleagues in Biblical Studies distinguish between what they call aspective and partitive accounts of human nature. The question I've raised tonight is a partitive question. What parts are humans made of? Biblical authors, though, weren't interested in that question. They wanted to know about aspects of human life. How do we relate to the natural world? How do we relate to our fellow human beings? In particular, how do we relate to God? So I believe that their answer to my quiz would be number four. That question really doesn't make sense. This means that the passage from 1 Thessalonians that I read earlier should probably go more like this. May the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may you be kept sound and blameless spiritually and psychically and physically until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so where did Christians get their dualism if not from the Bible? Many of you are probably already aware that Christian theology has been shaped very much by patterns of thought coming from the Hellenistic world. That is, while Christianity began among the Jews, it very quickly spread throughout the Mediterranean world. Greek culture, that is, Greek language, Greek customs, Greek ideas, had infiltrated all of those other Mediterranean cultures, much the way Western culture is now influencing third world countries. One of the biggest jobs for early theologians and evangelists then was to find ways of relating the gospel to these Greek or Hellenistic ways of thinking. So it's important to know what sorts of ideas there were out and about uh, concerning the nature of human beings in the Mediterranean world during those early centuries. Well, there was a pretty thorough confusion, just as there is today. Today, there are materialists who say that human beings are nothing but atoms. Then, there were the Epicurean philosophers who said that body and soul were nothing but atoms. Today, there are some New Age thinkers who believe that our bodies are animated by a little spark of the divine, in essence, our souls are a part of God. 
Some held the same view then. Now, I don't want to press the similarities too far because much has changed since the first centuries of the Christian era. For example, our knowledge of the nature of atoms has changed, and so current materialists can't be saying quite the same thing that their ancient predecessors were. I just want to make the point that Christians in the first centuries had a similar problem as we have today, figuring out how best to relate Christian teaching to the culture's various theories of human nature. Augustine, who lived from 354 to 430 in the Christian era, has probably been the most influential theologian since the Apostle Paul. And for many centuries, he pretty well settled the question of the nature of the person. Augustine was well-educated philosophically, and he found one particular um, strand of philosophical thinking to be a very useful tool for making Christian theology intelligible for his own day. This is a school of philosophy called Neoplatonism because it was a development in Augustine's own day of the ideas of the philosopher Plato, who lived three and a half centuries before Christ. Plato had taught that the human person is composed of two parts a mortal body, and an immortal soul. In fact, he believed that the soul was eternal, pre-existing the body, and only temporarily imprisoned in the body during earthly life. The soul's true home is a transcendental realm of ideas. Now, the Neoplatonists developed a set of religious practices that involved suppressing the body and its drives in order to cultivate the soul and to ensure its return to the transcendent realm at death. Augustine's views are similar. Augustine taught that the person is composed of two parts, an immortal soul, not eternal, since it has a created beginning, and he described the soul as using a mortal body, using it rather than being imprisoned in it, since the doctrine of creation for Christians makes it unhandy to think of the body as evil. So at least from Augustine's day up to the present century, most Christians have held some form of body-soul dualism. In this century, however, this dualism has been called radically into question by biblical scholars and by church historians, and they've been pursuing the same sort of lines that I've introduced to you tonight. That is, they've pointed to evidence that body-soul dualism was a later development in Christian history and that it is more like, it's more likely to have been read back into the biblical texts rather than having been found there in the first place. So one factor that accounts for differences among people in our culture on my quiz is that for Christians, if they have or have not been influenced by uh, recent biblical criticism. So um, many still hold to a dualist account. Uh, a number of others have uh, felt free to give up on dualism and move to a physicalist view in light of those critical studies. Now, I gave you two options here for dualism, body-soul dualism or mind-body dualism, and I want to take just a little bit of time to talk about the relationship between those two views. And for this purpose, I have to plague you with a little bit more history of philosophy. In the Middle Ages, Plato's influence on theology uh, contributed to the tradition largely through Augustine was overshadowed by that of one of his students, Aristotle. Many of Aristotle's works were lost to Europeans during the so-called Dark Ages of European history, but they were reintroduced into the West by Arab scholars um, after the conquest of Spain. And uh, so Aristotle's views soon supplanted Plato's, or at least complemented Plato's, in influencing Christian theology. Now, in order to explain uh, what difference this has made for understandings of the soul, I have to start with an account of matter or material stuff that Aristotle developed. For Aristotle, matter, material stuff, 
is passive. It has the potential to become all sorts of things, but only if some active principle affects it. In some of my classes, I explain this uh, um, philosophical move by using the example of pasta dough. You've got this white lump in the bowl. It's passive, and it ha but it has the potential to become any number of things. It can become spaghetti or lasagna or whatever, but only if some active agent, such as the cook, comes along and does something with it. Now, natural things have their active agents within them. The active part of any entity, according to Aristotle, is called its form. So every existing thing is composed of passive matter and active form. Now, living things have powers or faculties or capacities that go far beyond those of non-living things. Rocks, for instance, can't grow or reproduce. This means that living things must have more potent and interesting sorts of forms than rocks do. These more interesting sorts of forms are called, in Aristotle's philosophy, souls. Plants have the economy model souls, forms that give them the capacities to take in nutrients, to grow, and to reproduce. These are called nutritive or vegetative souls. Animals have these nutritive powers, but add to them the capacity to perceive things and to move around. Our human souls give us all of these capacities, the same as the vegetables and animals, but more besides. We have the deluxe model, you might say, the rational soul. Here is a list of the parts of Aristotle's tripartite soul. Now, many medieval theologians, when once Aristotle's philosophy was reintroduced into the West, were much impressed by it and set out to try to incorporate it into the theological tradition. Thomas Aquinas, living in the 13th century, was most effective at doing this, and he's turned out to be the most um, uh, influential among Catholic theologians. Thomas took Aristotle's tripartite soul and gave a uh, still more um, complex account of the nature of the soul. You can see the three parts, the vegetable, animal, and the rational, and here are the same um, faculties that Aristotle had attributed to the vegetable soul. Nutrition, the power to take in nutrients, to grow, and to reproduce. Also, in the, for the animal soul, we see locomotion and the five senses. But he also emphasized appetite. And here he means what he calls sensory appetite. That is, the capacity to be attracted to things that can be perceived with the senses. And so attraction to food or attraction to a mate. The sorts of um, appetites that we share with the animals. There are also four internal senses, and I'm not going to talk about those now because I'm going to come back to those later. But if you combine the sensitive appetite with the internal senses, uh, Thomas argued, that accounts for our emotional capacities. And so he was assuming that animals share emotions with us and that uh, emotions are uh, a product or a capacity that's made possible for us because we share an animal soul. The rational soul is what makes us unique, uniquely and distinctly human, and this is an oversimplification, but he distinguished two different forms of intellectual activity, passive and active. Passive has more to do with memory than it does with um, active cogitation, and then the will, and I'll come back and talk about those more later. Now, remember that the point of all this was to talk about what, uh, where does the difference come from between mind-body dualism and body-soul dualism. And so now we have to um, whiz up to the beginning of the modern period, which is a, taken by philosophers to be around the year 1650. 1650 is the year that Rene Descartes died, and Descartes is considered the father of modern philosophy. Descartes is responsible for uh, setting up 
the um, early modern conception of the nature of the person. And he's also responsible for shifting the very meaning of the word soul. For Aristotle and Thomas, the soul is responsible for life, movement, sensation, and mental capacities. However, Descartes thought that living beings were just um, mechanical, soft, squishy, mechanical devices. He thought they were moved by hydraulic power. And so he did not believe that you needed a soul in order to account for uh, growth and reproduction. He also believed that locomotion could be accounted for mechanically, and so that also was removed from the responsibility of the soul. Um, Descartes had a lot of um, ambivalence about the appetites, so he didn't really like to talk about those much at all. And uh, the senses have always been a problem when one talks about body-soul dualism, because it's obvious that parts of the body are involved in sensation, the eyeballs, for instance, but the actual sensible uh, perception has often been thought of as a mental capacity. But um, Descartes was inclined to emphasize the role of the body in uh, perception. And we won't, again, we won't talk about the internal senses. So basically what's left of the soul for Descartes is really only the rational soul. And notice that those are capacities that we are equally likely to attribute to the mind. And so when Descartes used the uh, Latin words, uh, he wrote in both Latin and, and uh, French, the words that he used can just as well be translated mind as soul. And so in the um, earlier translations of Descartes' writings, often the, word, the English word soul is used. And I notice that as you get closer and closer to contemporary times, it's less and less likely to find those words translated soul, and more and more likely to find them translated as mind. And I think that that reflects the um, uh, progressive secularization of the discipline of philosophy, because the way it has turned out, mind tends to be the term that's used in philosophical circles, whereas soul is um, left for use in spiritual contexts. And so whereas the terms were um, overlapping uh, in the me medieval period, pretty much synonymous for Descartes, they've come to have quite radical connotations in our own day, as can be seen from this bit of a cartoon. No lost minds department, or at least if you were looking for a lost mind, you would find a psychiatrist or psychologist there instead. So another reason that we have different answers to give to the quiz that I started with, it depends on whether one is working out primarily out of a philosophical context or out of a religious context. So these are, this is a, a very quick and dirty account of some of the origins of dualistic thought in our culture. And what I want to do now is to turn to contemporary science in order to look at some of the reasons that, are, that lie behind a um, recent move toward the uh, adopting of a physicalist account of the person. In other words, reasons for giving up on body-soul or mind-body dualism, and also, of course, giving up on trichotomism um, as well. First of all, there's been a problem throughout the modern era in giving an account of how mind and body could interact. And this depends on the radical change in the understanding of the very nature of material stuff that we see with the rejection of Aristotle's theory of matter and the adoption of early modern physics. Remember that for Aristotle, matter was just the kind of stuff that was lying there passively, waiting to be acted upon by forms, and souls were just one of the of one uh, class of forms. When we get to the modern period, we've got early modern physics, and matter is now conceived along atomistic lines. Uh, we can think of matter in, in those early days as um, much like tiny billiard balls, and therefore matter is not moved by internal principles of action, but rather it's moved by external forces. 
If you want to move a billiard ball, you don't appeal to its soul, you get a billiard cue. Now, Descartes defined mind as that which is essentially non-material. So it has no mass, no force, and it looks like it's the sort of thing that by definition can't move matter. So how on earth could the mind, the non-material mind, affect a material body? There has not been any widely accepted answer to that question throughout the history of modern thought. And that's one of the reasons that a number of philosophers and scientists have finally decided that um, body-soul dualism or mind-body dualism uh, simply is not a tenable position. The problem of mind-body interaction seems to be insuperable. There are more recent and dramatic scientific developments that are relevant here, and in fact, um, I believe it's developments in neuroscience that have done the most to uh, turn the tables away from dualism and toward physicalism. Here's my claim. I claim that all of the capacities or faculties that were once attributed to the soul are now being studied effectively by neuroscience. More particularly, there is good evidence for the claim that all of the capacities once attributed to the soul are capacities of the brain or the brain plus the rest of the body. Therefore, to postulate a mind or a soul in addition to the body is simply no longer needed in order to explain those human capacities. So, I'm going to be arguing for physicalism. Over against dualism or trichotomism. Now, physicalism, as I understand it, there are lots of uh, versions of physicalism out there. But the physicalism that I advocate is the claim that all human capacities, mental, emotional, moral, and even spiritual, are capacities of the physical person. And I would add to that the physical person in community. I think most of our mental abilities are um, uh, equally dependent on social milieu as they are on the brain. And I want to distinguish my view from the reductionist account that says that there simply aren't, aren't any such higher human capacities. Now, to make my argument, what I'm going to do is go back to Aquinas' account of the capacities of the soul. And I'm going to talk to you about each of these and the extent to which neuroscience, or at least other branches of biology, are beginning to uh, study and explain these um, capacities or faculties. I'm going to work up from the bottom. I think we can all pretty well agree that biology now deals with questions of uh, taking in nutrients, growth, all those things you learned about um, the Krebs cycle and that sort of thing. And since the discovery of DNA, biology does a pretty good job in accounting for reproduction. So we no longer think that a carrot, for instance, has to have a soul in order to be alive. And so basically we're saying that we don't assume you have to add a soul to non-material or uh, inorganic material in order to get a living um, uh, organism. Now, biology also gives pretty good accounts of locomotion and the appetites. And here we're beginning to get into the area of neuroscience. For example, uh, the part of the brain that is largely responsible for uh, coordinating motion is the motor cortex. That's um, this, um, this area here. And so uh, neuroscience is making an important contribution to understanding locomotion in Thomas's um, list of capacities. Appetites also. Uh, 
have to do with neuro, or neuroscience is beginning to shed some light on the appetites. Uh, for instance, neurotransmitters are important in uh, governing one's appetite for food. And so I believe that those of us who'd be willing to kill for carbohydrates can blame it on a low serotonin level. The five senses. Lots of very interesting um, empirical research going on in this area. For example, we now know that vision depends on two different kinds of light sensitive cells in the retina. The information that comes from the retina travels through processors of various sorts to the visual cortex, which is located in the back of the head. Similarly, smell depends on six kinds of receptor cells in the nose, and that information is processed and fed to the olfactory lobes in the brain. So there's a great deal of research that could be talked about here. Now, I want to talk about uh, Thomas's four internal senses. Uh, first of all, because I think Thomas was a remarkably acute cognitive scientist for his day, and also um, because a number of the um, cognitive capacities that he lists here have very interesting parallels in neuroscientific research. The first of these is the fantasia, and that uh, term is often translated imagination. It has to do with the question, how do images that come from the senses get imprinted and stored in the mind? And how can we, how, what's going on when we recall a visual image? Neuroscientists are hard at work on this question. One example is this. Uh, PET scans, uh, positron emission tom tomography, are scans that make it possible to tell which parts of the brain are more active than others because they measure the amount of oxygen that's being burned. There's one study that, um, uh, in which a subject was asked to close her eyes and visualize a scene. The PET scan that was done during that time showed elevated activity in her visual cortex in exactly the same location as when she was actually looking at the scene, but it was only fainter. And so this shows that it's uh, beginning to be possible to um, uh, study empirically the processes of visual imagination. <coughs> the vis estimativa, this is the ability to judge or estimate the value of something, to judge it as friendly or unfriendly, useful or useless. Animals have this capacity. For example, how does a young monkey know that it should be afraid of a snake before it's had a chance to be bitten by one? Now, one instance of this for humans is being able to recognize threatening behavior in others. While there doesn't seem to be any single location responsible for this capacity, there are patients whose brain damage has resulted in its loss. There's a patient called, called Boswell who suffers from extensive lesions to the frontal pole of both temporal lobes and to the underpart of the frontal cortex. Among many of his mental deficits is the inability to perceive emotion. One observer writes, I watched as Boswell was shown a series of dramatic posters advertising sundry Hollywood movies. He was asked to say what was going on in each. One of them showed a man and a woman in close portrait confronting one another angrily. The man's mouth was open in a plainly hostile shout. Boswell, without evident discomfort or dismay, explained that the man appeared to be singing to the woman. So again, we have the um, capacity to study in terms of uh, neural function, uh, a, a cognitive capacity that Thomas once attributed to the soul. The vis memorativa, as you may have guessed, has something to do with memory, but it's a special sort of memory related to sensory information. Thomas's passive intellect is another kind of memory. Now, there's a lot of uh, research in neuroscience having to do with various forms of memory. Some neuroscientists distinguish six different memory functions, and that's why it's possible for you, for instance, to remember a fact but not to be able to remember how you came to know it. Uh, these two different memory systems are called autobiographical versus declarative memory. And information about these different memory systems comes from uh, very often studying victims of brain damage. 
quite often a localized lesion will knock out one sort of memory while sparing the others. The census communis is the capacity to collate and combine information from a variety of different senses. How is it that I can associate the brownness that I see, the bark that I hear, and the softness of the fur that I feel with my hand, all with the same dog? This is considered one of the greatest challenges to neuroscience, and it's called the binding problem. In other words, visual stimuli, auditory stimuli, etc., are all sent to different parts of the brain. How does the brain then get that information back together so that these various sensory modalities uh, are recognized to be informing us about the same object? Now, I'm not going to say a whole lot about the rational capacities. Um, Various cognitive and intellectual abilities are being studied by a combination of cognitive science, neuroscience, and then also looking for parallels or models using um, artificial intelligence. Um, scientists are farther from studying these higher mental capacities than they are from some of the lower ones. Um, but one way to make clear the extent to which all of our uh, intellectual capacities are dependent on the brain is to look at the way they depend on language and it's very easy to show that language in turn depends on the brain. Again much of the information comes from studies of people with localized brain damage. Um, uh, damage by means of a stroke or a localized tumor uh, can now be spotted using various brain scanning techniques and the location of the damage can then be associated with various deficits in cognitive functioning. It's been known for a long time that two areas of the brain are importantly associated with language. There's Broca's area and Warnicke's area. It turns out that language ability is actually widely distributed through the brain and a very interesting finding is that different linguistic capacities seem to depend on different brain regions. This is a, a drawing from a book by Paul Churchland and notice that he locates verb access, proper name access, common noun access in different regions and it's even the case that some patients uh, have no noticeable deficit in cognitive functioning after brain damage except that they can't recall the names of colors. And so it shows that uh, quite specifically located regions in the brain are involved in uh, not just language processes in general but in very specific aspects of linguistic processes. Now it's important to say that it's not the case that all of our use of verbs is done by this part of the brain. All we know is that if that part of the brain is knocked out, then the capacity to recall verbs is lost. Uh, but actually there's some um, um, uh, interlocking systems in the brain are ob pretty ob obviously involved in linguistic abilities. <coughs> now, one last cognitive function of Thomas's soul is the will. The will was understood by Thomas as a higher appetitive faculty whose object goes beyond the things that we can perceive with the senses. Remember that we share with animals the lower sorts of appetites that attract us to things that we can see and hear and smell. So Thomas is saying that we humans have an additional capacity beyond that which we share with animals to be attracted to good things of a different sort. In fact, he says, the object of this faculty is the good itself, which in Thomas's theology is God. So here we find our common sense notion that the soul is what enables us to relate to God. Morality, then, is a function of our capacity to be attracted to the good, combined with rational judgments about what the good actually consists in. Have we now finally gotten to a point beyond what neuroscience can study?
Well, there's a famous story that I think crops up in nearly every lecture on neuroscience. This is the story about uh, Phineas Gage. Gage was a railway worker, and his job was to blast rock in order to make uh, straight uh, roadbeds for laying track. And the task involved drilling holes into the rock, pouring in black powder, putting sand over that, and then tamping the sand with an iron rod. Well, one day, unfortunately, Gage was distracted in the middle of the process. He'd poured in the black powder, and he didn't realize that his assistant had not put in the sand. And so he began tamping directly on the uh, black powder itself. The consequence was that there was an explosion. The rod shot out of the hole. It went through his cheek and came out through the top of his head. Gage's doctor describes how Gage regained his strength and how his physical recovery was complete. He could touch, hear, see, and was not paralyzed of limb or tongue. He'd lost vision in that one eye, but his vision was perfect in the right. He walked firmly, used his hands with dexterity, and had no noticeable difficulty with speech or language. And yet, as Dr. Harlow recounts, the equilibrium or balance, so to speak, between his intellectual faculty and his animal propensities had been destroyed. The changes became apparent as soon as the acute phase of brain injury subsided. He was now fitful, irreverent, indulging at times in the grossest profanity, which was not previously his custom, manifesting but little deference for his fellows, impatient of restraint or advice when it conflicts with his desires, at times pertinaciously obstinate, yet capricious and vacillating, devising many plans of future operation, which are no sooner arranged than they are abandoned. These new personality traits contrasted sharply with the temperate habits and considerable energy of character that Phineas Gage was known to have possessed before. He had had a well-balanced mind and was looked upon by those who knew him as a shrewd businessman, very energetic and persistent in executing all his plans of action. So radical was the change in him that his friends and acquaintances could hardly recognize the man. They noted sadly that Gage was no longer Gage. So different a man was he that his employers had to let him go shortly after he returned to work. The problem was not the lack of physical ability or skill. It was his new moral character. Contemporary neuroscientists Antonio and Hanna Damasio uh, were able to acquire Gage's skull and reconstruct the exact region of the brain that must have been destroyed by the metal rod passing through. Now notice the significance of this finding. Destroy one small part of the brain. It may leave your cognitive capacities intact, but it will change your moral character. There are other similar cases that the uh, living uh, examples that the Damasios have studied directly. So we can say that there's a region of the brain that's needed for the operation of what Thomas calls the will. That is, the um, capacity to be attracted to the higher things of life. To put Gage's story in Thomas's language, he lost his appetite for the good. The accounts I've read don't mention anything about Gage's previous or later uh, interest in religion, but if Thomas is correct about how humans relate to God, then Gage would have lost his appetite for God as well. So I come back to the central claim of this section of my lecture. All of the capacities once attributed to the soul are now yielding to study by the neurosciences. The concept of a soul is simply no longer needed. Now I want to interrupt myself at this point and say just a little bit about the difference between reductive and non-reductive physicalist accounts. There are a number of neuroscientists right now who are studying uh, not just uh, intellectual and moral behavior as products of the brain, but also are attempting to study religious experience uh, from the point of view of neuroscience. One response to the results that they come up with would be to say, aha, religious experience is nothing but brain activity. But consider this, 
uh, neuroscientists are also doing at least as much to trace out the brain structures and processes that are involved in vision. And it's not the case that we then conclude, aha, we found the part of the brain that's responsible for these visual images, uh, therefore there aren't any material objects in the world in, that they are perceiving. What we say instead is, aha, we found the brain systems that are involved in seeing those external objects. And so non-reductive physicalism does not need to deny the existence of God. It does not need to deny the existence or validity of religious experience. One only needs to say that if God has anything to do with us, then being physical organisms, he must somehow be having to do with our physical bodies. And of course, the most likely location for God having to do with us affecting our experience would be by affecting our brains. So I want to make the sharpest possible distinction between a physicalist account of the person that simply dismisses all of our higher capacities and a physicalist account that says, aha, it must be the brain that is what enables us to have those higher physical capacities. And this begins to get into my second question for tonight's lecture, the so what. I remind you that I set out to address two issues. From whence comes the great variety of our responses to my quiz? And we've looked at some of the history and also looked at some of the contemporary scientific findings. But I also set out to answer the question, should religious folks have a stake in how these arguments come out? I've already um, uh, at least implicitly begun to answer the question of what these uh, neuroscience discoveries mean for the Christian tradition at least, because I've suggested that um, dualism never was a part of original Christian or Jewish teaching. Uh, there's supposed to be a t-shirt. I've never actually seen anybody who has one of these, but it's supposed to say, uh, the Bible says it, I believe it, that settles it. And so we could turn this around and we could say, the Bible doesn't say it, I don't have to believe it, and that settles it. But that may be proceeding a little bit too quickly. There may be other issues that we'll want to think about. One place, as I've suggested at the beginning, that these issues make a very big difference is in dealing with the question of death and life after death. A poignant way for me to um, point to the significance of the disagreements is that um, I went with my mother to the cemetery uh, for the first time after my father was buried. And we were sitting there looking at the grave and after a while my mother said, well, you know, Nancy, he's really not here. And I thought to myself, oh, yes, he is. And fortunately, I had enough sense to keep my mouth shut. But these are things that we can and should talk about in lecture halls, even if not at funerals and in cemeteries. Let's look first at Jewish thought about life after death. Beginning around the second century, before the Christian era, there were two independent developments in Jewish thought concerning the afterlife. Prior to that point, the Jewish tradition had, by and large, taken death simply to be the final end of human life. One of these developments was the development of expectation of bodily resurrection at the end of time. The other was adoption of a dualist account of the person, according to which the soul survives the death of the body. I quote Jewish scholar Neil Gilman, in their original form, the two doctrines of the resurrection of the body and the immortality of the soul appear independent of each other. One knows nothing of bodies, the other knows nothing of souls. One ascribes personal identity to the body, the other to the soul. One teaches that at the end of time the body will be revived. The other insists that the soul is immortal and needs no revival." End of quote. However, Rabbinic Judaism, which uh, dates from around the year 200 of the Christian era, conflated these two traditions, teaching that the soul leaves the body at death, but receives a resurrected body at some later time. Now, the original Christian view 
of life after death was resurrection of the body also. Now, this doesn't mean resuscitation of a corpse, but rather the sort of transformation that Jesus was uh, believed to have undergone when he was raised from the dead. Paul had a double message. He was uh, talking to a lot of Jewish Christians who did not believe in resurrection of the body, and so he had to convince them that resurrection really was a possibility. But he was also talking to um, Christians from Hellenistic backgrounds who believed in the immortality of the soul. For them, the goal of life is to shed the body so that the soul can go back to its um, more natural state. And so Paul was having to preach out of both sides of his mouth, you might say, to convince the one party that resurrection was a possibility, to convince the other party that resurrection wasn't such a bad thing to have to put up with um, uh, at the end of time. So I claim that both Judaism and Christianity began with a concept of human nature that comes closer to contemporary physicalism than to Platonic dualism. Both made accommodations to dualistic philosophy and combined a doctrine of immortality of the soul with a doctrine of the resurrection of the body. The pressing question now is whether to return to these earlier physicalist accounts of human nature, as many Christian theologians recently have been urging. I return to the writings of Neil Gilman. He points out that while many Jews since the Enlightenment have given up on all concepts of life after death, there's a current movement within Judaism to recapture the doctrine of bodily resurrection rather than immortality of the soul. He says, why stress bodily resurrection rather than immortality of the soul? For many reasons. Because the notion of immortality tends to deny the reality of death, of God's power to take my life and to restore it. Because the doctrine of immortality implies that my body is less precious, important, even pure, while resurrection affirms that my body is not less God's creation and is both necessary and good. Because the notion of a bodily, bodiless soul runs counter to my experience of myself and of others. And because resurrection affirms the significance of society." End quote. I'd also add to that that uh, resurrection of the body and physicalism, recognition of our um, total involvement in the rest of the natural world also provides a good motivation for a greater care and concern about the natural world. My, uh, I have a uh, friend who's a Lutheran theologian uh, by the name of Ted Peters, and he characterizes many Christian views of salvation as soul-ectomy. That is, what salvation involves is having my soul extracted from my body and also from society and from the universe as a whole and taken off to some better place. German theologian Wolfhard Pannenberg proposes what I think is a much more authentic Christian view that involves the ultimate transformation of the entire cosmos. That is, the sort of transformation that Jesus underwent in the resurrection is a foretaste, he says, of the transformation that awaits not only the rest of us humans, but the whole of the cosmos at the end of time. Now, you may or may not have followed me through this account of the afterlife. These are matters of hope and faith, not things we can see or even discuss with any sort of clarity. But whether or not you take these final matters seriously, your account of what constitutes human nature is important. It has implications not only for what you say or don't say at funerals, but for how you live your life here and now. Is your body really you? Are you really a part of the natural world? Or are you simply a soul passing through? Thank you.
just lay it in my life. <laughs> Very much appreciated what you had to say tonight. Thank you. Uh, and particularly admire the clarity with which you can lay things out. Uh, I, as a beginning point uh, for the discussion, I think it might be worthwhile to ask you to say a little bit about what kind of a thing you were doing theologically in terms of what you see to be what you're doing as an instance of contemporary dialogue between science and religion. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, the job of the theologian, as I understand it, is to be um, constantly evaluating and reevaluating the teaching of the various. Uh, I'd appreciate it if you would please not comment while she's speaking. Not now, please. Would someone see this person to be removed if he's going to keep on speaking? Okay, you disappoint me. <laughs> Just look, there's, there'll be an opportunity to ask a question uh, from the microphone later. No, you didn't come here for that, you know? There are a lot of people who paid a lot of money to come here, and, and it's not your right to just interfere with that, so uh, keep it till later. Uh, my understanding of the purpose of theology is to be um, a constant source of evaluation and reevaluation of the teaching that we do uh, in the churches. And um, it's always uh, evaluation and reevaluation, not only in light of the original sources, but also in light of the culture in which the theology is being. Uh, promoted and evaluated. And it's clear that, the, that science has come to be one of the most significant contributors to our understanding of the world that we live in. And so it, a central task for theologians really must be a dialogue with the scientific worldview. Uh, it's not, uh, this is really nothing new. Uh, as I said in my talk, the development of Christian theology itself was really a matter of finding ways to make Christian teaching understandable and intelligible in a very different cultural milieu. So uh, 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 dealing with science is really uh, going, uh, continuing the same sort of task. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm a little bit thrown by the uh, 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 unhappy uh, reception of my of my talk. Did I did I answer your question, or is there? Yeah. What, let me. Let me. <laughs> Why am I here? <laughs> More specifically, I'd like you to speak to it a bit further. Um, do you conceive yourself in doing theology as trying to uh, just bring uh, theological understanding into conformity with contemporary science? Or do you see uh, the, uh, something more of, than this simply going on in, in terms of terms of theology? In other words, does oh, theology yeah. need simply to, to justify itself in the modern world by showing that it's consistent with modern science, or is, or is there something else to what you're doing? Oh, yes, very, there's uh, really a great deal more to it. Um, I, I, I believe that dualism has been not only a foreign influence in Christian theology, but I think it's actually distorted Christian teaching to a great extent. Uh, when I was talking about understanding salvation in um, Ted Peters' rather uh, flippant term as soul ectomy, uh, I think that's a terrible distortion of what Jesus was teaching, which has a great deal to do with um, our uh, with saving the whole person. He was concerned with health. He was concerned with poverty. He was concerned with uh, clothing those uh, the naked. He was very much concerned with um, establishing a social order, not simply saving individuals. And so, as we uh, science makes us take a look at what we've been teaching about the nature of the person, and in this particular case, it 
it, it's a salutary change. It makes us recognize that dualism was not part of original Christian teaching. It asks us, uh, has dualism in fact distorted the message? And can we reclaim a more authentic version of Christian teaching by abandoning the dualism and going back to something that's uh, much more akin to contemporary physicalism? Okay, so you see then part of what you're doing is an attempt to go back to, through the stimulus of exposure to what's going on in modern science. That's right. Go back That's to right. something more, more primitive in, in terms of getting back to what the scriptural understanding is. That's right. My hope, uh, my expectation, if I think Christian teaching is true and that science is a valuable road to knowledge, is ultimately there'll be harmony. And um, everybody in the modern world is aware of cases where theologians have backed off and backed down, but as the theological tradition has progressed through the modern period, in many cases, what looked like uh, a giving in or a backing down has actually turned into uh, a deeper understanding of uh, theological truth. And so that's what I always hope would be the result. Uh, it's not to say that you can rule out in advance that there would ever be any uh, solid conflicts that can't be resolved so easily. All right. Um, in connection with this, uh, I was wondering with, with the diagram you, you, you set up uh, or in, on the overhead uh, of the different options specifically, I, I was wondering whether there perhaps are more options than you uh, outline there. Mm. Although maybe, maybe some of what I might be aware of as other options might be included under some that you're talking about. One in particular uh, is, is an option where a, a number of current writers in the dialogue between science and religion want to talk about a kind of, of a hierarchy of levels yes. of organization and emergent properties that uh, they deal with, particularly in connection with the non-reduction mm -hmm. or the non-reducibility of certain higher level functioning to lower level functioning. Uh, although not all of them are comfortable, I think, with the term physicalism. Could you mm -hmm. explain how your view relates to that, or do you just see that as a yes. physicalist view? We're really in the process of hunting for uh, uniform terminology that will allow all of us who agree in essentials to use the same terms for our positions and distinguish our positions from those of others. And a, an earlier set of terms that were developed um, in the century would be um, terms such as emergent monism, um, and I believe there are some other close variations there. I chose the term non-reductive physicalism because monism is ambiguous. It could, um, monism itself simply means that the person is composed of one kind of stuff, and that could be either material stuff or the idealists would say it's all mental stuff. Mm -hmm. And so physicalism is a clearer and less ambiguous term than monism is. Also, there were, uh, I understand that there were some very uh, hot and acrimonious debates in philosophy of biology about the meaning of the word emergent or emergentism. And so trying to uh, skirt around some of the um, uh, lingering heat from that debate, uh, that's another reason that I think non-reductive physicalism is more useful than emergent monism. But when it comes down to what the emergent monists are claiming and what I would claim, I really can't find any essential differences between what we're saying. Okay. And, and one, one question I had in connection with your, your uh, quick and dirty uh, account of the history of, of Western thought on these issues. Uh, I, I, was, I was puzzled first by I think the interpretation you're giving the Aristotelian tradition uh, in seemingly uh, developing or at least lending support to a dualist view, whereas uh, at least the line of interpretation of Aristotle I was more familiar with treat uh, the various functions or capacities that he talks about of the soul as functions of the whole organism uh, at, rather than something that's somehow added separately to uh, the material stuff. Yes, um, I actually agree with that, but as it turns out, I think because of the theological uses that were made of Aristotle, I think nonetheless he ended up contributing to um, dualism within popular Christianity. And the reason for that is that Thomas Aquinas was not content, well, if you have the account of soul that you've just described, the form of the body, um, the natural assumption about what happens to the form when the body dies is that the form is gone, just as uh, uh, 
you have a pot with a shape, you crush the pot, the, the shape is gone. But uh, Thomas not being satisfied theologically with the um, assumption that the soul simply to, ceases to exist at death, uh, developed a very complex argument as to why the human soul alone would survive the demise of the body. And uh, that set began, in fact, that began to sound more platonic in certain respects. And so I think it's contributed to uh, at least popular Christianity's view of um, body-soul dualism with the soul leaving the body, surviving the death of the body, and leaving it at death. I'm wondering if, before we open it up, you might say a little bit about uh, what you might, in, in the dialogue between science and religion, which you see yourself functioning here, and as well as other things that you've written and spoken to, and what I heard you speak earlier to today, to some extent. Do you see uh, theology as bringing something of importance to the dialogue for science to hear? Yes. I. Um uh, that's a much more difficult question. Uh, it's uh, turned out to be quite easy to find ways in which uh, scientific knowledge can contribute to theological development. But being uh, trained more on the theology side than the science side, I always thought it would not be fair if the theologians only listened and uh, couldn't have their say in the dialogue as well. So uh, I've always been interested in looking for ways that um, theology could have uh, a, a role to play in the development of science. And it's much easier to see those things looking back. Uh, for instance, I recently um, wrote a little bit about the development of evolutionary biology and uh, looked at the ways not only uh, prior biological developments had influenced Darwin, but also the way that Thomas Malthus's um, theory of population dynamics influenced him, which is very common knowledge, but also at the way that understanding of population growth was used in theological circles uh, as part of what uh, theologians call a theodicy, a way of justifying the suffering in light of the assumption of the goodness of God. And so it appears to me that Darwin, in fact, was influenced by theological uses of Malthus, not simply by the um, uh, population calculations and the observations that he made. So um, scientists, I know, um, uh, get very nervous when we start talking about theology having any influence on uh, scientific developments. And so I'm not proposing anything for the future. I'm just saying there have been interesting instances in the past and that they haven't been all bad. I'm wondering in this connection about whether you might say something further on this in light of the uh, book that you published on, moral, on the moral nature of the universe in terms of uh, the, the moral perspective that might be brought to bear. Oh, yes. Uh, uh, when I responded to your question first, I was thinking yeah. of the natural sciences. Um, uh, George Ellis and I uh, wrote a book in which we deal with uh, what we try to do is uh, form a sort of coherent worldview uh, with a theological account that fits in with what we know about the world from the natural sciences. But we also wanted to see if we could find relationships between the theology that we advocated and the social sciences. And despite the fact that there have been arguments for the value-free character of the social sciences for years, um, it's now recognized by quite a few people that it's uh, not really possible to keep um, moral presuppositions, uh, value judgments out of the social sciences themselves. And so, for instance, a common assumption that one runs into in sociology, political science, is the assumption that social order depends ultimately on either violence or the threat of violence. Um, George Ellis and I both work from a pacifist perspective, and so our theology and our theological ethic leads us to at least dream about the possibility of a social order that doesn't depend on violence for its survival and stability. And so we propose in that book that um, once you, you bring to light some of these moral presuppositions, it would be possible to criticize those in the light of a different the theological ethic and then see whether there were interesting research consequences that would flow from uh, that change in um, underlying ethical presupposition. Especially in the social sciences, you're saying? Exactly, in the social sciences. Okay, but you don't see that as necessarily having a bearing 
on the natural sciences? <laughs> no, I don't. Except it's, perhaps for their use. Right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think it would be appropriate now to, to uh, receive questions or comments from persons in the audience. If there are some. Over here. Uh, yes, I think you said uh, something about there are some neuroscientists now working, trying to determine what part of the brain is affected or uh, responds to religious experiences. Yes. And if you said something about that, could you tell me perhaps uh, if it's uh, explained in more detail in one of your books or uh, perhaps direct me to some literature on it? Uh, the names of the neuroscientists that I happen to know of are Andrew Newberg, who uh, does his research Oh, I, I can't remember the name of the hospital, but he's um, uh, head of um, neurological research at a hospital in Philadelphia. And uh, his interest is in studying what happens in the brain when uh, someone is in meditation. Uh, the other that I know about is uh, V.S. Ramachandran, who teaches neuroscience at the University of San Diego. And his research has to do with uh, victims of temporal lobe epilepsy. It doesn't bear directly on religious experience, uh, but there's a, a, an indirect connection because uh, people with that form of epilepsy often have um, uh, strong religious ideation and uh, engage in uh, repetitive religious practices. And so the hypothesis is if the part of the brain, the temporal lobes, that um, when damaged by the epilepsy uh, produce um, um, uh, religious-like behavior, there may, that may be a part of the brain that's also involved in what you might call normal. Uh, religious experience or religious behavior. And unfortunately, I, I can't give you any um, references right now, but um, I'm a guest editor for the Journal of Consciousness Studies, and we will have an issue coming out uh, next year that will uh, include papers by both Andy Newberg and Ramachandran, along with um, some theological critique uh, and comment on those. So. Closest I can come. Just wanted to welcome you to Portland once again, Dr. Murphy, uh, with notwithstanding our, our one gentleman earlier. Thank um, you. And I'd also like to commend you on your, your brave foray into the, the no man's world, the no man's land of uh, Christian physicalism. And that brings up my, uh, my question is, could you comment a little bit on your, your definition or your uh, or your vision of physicalism in light of the view of physical matter uh, held by quantum physics, say, uh, which as opposed to atoms being billiard balls, which are moved upon mm. by billiard sticks, are more like non-local fields of energy separated by vast spaces of nothing, as we, as we presently understand it. And so when you start to break it down, you really lose all sense of any physicalness, even though if I were to say slap somebody that we know on the face, it would be very tangible feelings of physical. Could you please comment? Thanks. Not very much. <laughs> um, uh, only to say that it, it, it's a really interesting phenomenon that we've had um, uh, idealism and materialism as contrasting alternating philosophies throughout much of Western history and dualism is a sort of compromise, you know, metaphysical dualism is a sort of compromise measure. And um, all I can say is it's just fascinating that when you get to the uh, most basic of uh, basic material, you find that it's um, not quite so easily distinguished from the mental after all. But I don't know whether um, the quantum uh, characteristics of matter have a great deal of, um, whether they make a great deal of difference when we come to talking about the human person as a physical being and talking about neurological processes as the basis of human thought. Uh, there's a lot of controversy about that, as you probably know, Roger Penrose and a number of other um, um, scientists um, uh, and thinkers believe that it's not going to be possible to give an account of consciousness in terms of neuroscience without incorporating uh, quantum phenomena into that account. But I think it's just too early to say. Thank you. Dr. Murphy, your biographical material uh, identifies you with the Brethren Church. Uh, could you comment on how consistent 
the views of the Brethren Church are with what you presented tonight? Well, uh, the Church of the Brethren is a, a very small denomination that grows ultimately out of the Anabaptist or Radical Reformation in the 16th century. And uh, as far as I know, contemporary brethren don't address this subject at all. But it's very interesting that if you look back to the time of the Reformation and um, try to sort out the um, arguments over dualism uh, and uh, uh, various alternatives, the Anabaptists were more likely to be on the non-dualist side than, say, the Calvinists or the Lutherans were. Uh, one of the difficulties for um, Christian theologians in giving a physicalist account of the person is this bothersome issue of the intermediate state. That is, it's been taught by Calvin and Catholic theologians that when uh, individual humans die, they are immediately aware of the presence of God, uh, and that happens before they're, they're raised up. And so if you believe that there is this intervening conscious state before the resurrection of the body that pushes you pretty hard toward um, having to postulate uh, um, an immortal soul to maintain that consciousness. And uh, fortunately for me, uh, while the, the larger uh, Christian bodies in, in that era made the doctrine of the intermediate state uh, a central part of their teaching, the Anabaptists did not do that. So I'm uh, in line with a small minority of earlier Christians uh, who find physicalism not at all um, uh, contrary to their teaching. In connection with that, would you say something about how you see uh, alleged near-death experiences? Uh, tricky uh, to deal with in that it's hard to know um, how to distinguish between um, what we might think of as more hallucinatory experiences or uh, experiences that are more hallucinatory or experiences that are somehow representing reality. And since we don't know how to make that distinction, uh, it's not really clear what to make of the data. Okay, over here. Yeah, um, Dr. Murphy, um, I'm curious about a topic that you haven't really touched on at all. Um, my understanding of dualism is, or the, what I've been taught, is that dualism, the, the kind of soul, spirit part of a human being, is the part of a human being that's like God um, and, and that communicates with God. And I wonder if you'd talk a little bit, you know, if we look at human beings as purely physical, then what's the stuff of God? Um, if you have any thoughts about that, and, and how does the God stuff interact with the, the physical stuff? Good, good set of questions. Um, I think that the, one of the reasons Christians have been uh, tempted toward dualism is that in the um, Hellenistic world, there was uh, considered to be a hierarchy of beings, uh, inanimate objects, plants, animals, humans, uh, and then if you were Christian, angels, and then God, or if you were pagan, humans, and then perhaps other divine beings, and then maybe um, the chief divinity, depending on what system you were working in. And if you give a dualist account of us, you can put, you can make the dividing line between the physical and the uh, spiritual or the divine to run right through the middle of us. So the body goes on the downside, but the soul gets to go on the upside. And so we get to classify at least part of ourselves on that great, on the good side of that great metaphysical divide. That's not a Christian idea. Um, Christians and Jews in their uh, doctrine of creation emphasize the one radical metaphysical distinction being between God and everything else that God created. And so it's, uh, I think, much more in touch with original Christian teaching to think of ourselves as a part of the, completely as a part of the natural created order. And so we are made of the dust of the earth. Now, in terms of what is it about us that is like God, um, uh, if you have a concept of the soul, which is non-physical, spiritual, then it's very easy to say, ah, oh, that's the part of me that's like God. 
But there are lots of other ways to read those texts. And um, some of the better interpretations of what Genesis is talking about when it says that uh, man and woman were created in the image of God, it has to do with the role that man and woman are to play together in the created order. Uh, it very much involves their sociality. Male and female, he created them. He created them in God's image. And it has to do with the uh, role of stewardship or dominion that the human species has with relation to the rest of creation. So being like God is not being like God in terms of being immaterial. It's being like God in taking on the roles that God gives us to be his agents in, in the world. Okay, over here. Thank you. Yeah, I have two questions for you. The first one I have is, how would physicalism d explain the phenomenon of the sense of I, or the sense of the continuity of the self through all the, all the different phys physical changes through life? And even like I think of your example of Phineas Gage, it seems that even though Phineas Gage's desires or his character may have changed, he was still Phineas Gage. Mm -hmm. And so what would, what would create that sense of I? Mm -hmm. And then the second question I have is, is it sounds a lot like just scientism or the Enlightenment Project's attempt at creating a grand unifying theory to explain all of reality. And is that, is that what this is in a sense? Is just science just further trying to explain things that maybe it doesn't have the possibility to be able to explain? Uh, the sense of I develops, uh, uh, as far as I understand from um, developmental psychologists, the sense of I is not something that we're born with, but it's an acquisition. It's helped considerably by the fact that we have spatio-temporal continuity with our, if, with our bodies. Uh, as one of my um, acquaintances, Leslie Brothers, points out, there's fortunately a very happy rule, one person, one body. So uh, that contributes immensely to the sense of um, uh, our own personal continuity. Of course, also it's our memories. People who lose their memory have a very different sort of sense of self. So when we say this is the same person, we're using the criterion of the same body, but we're also using the criterion of uh, a continuity of, of memory, of uh, intentions, of purposes, etc. And fortunately, those things in the normal case go together. Uh, a number of the neuroscientists are um, somewhat skeptical about the actually the unity of consciousness. So Daniel Dennett, for instance, uh, thinks that our uh, conscious experience is actually much less unif unified and uniform than we tend to think. There are gaps in it and, and we tend to cover those up. So it's an interesting um, cognitive psychology question uh, as to how that sense of my um, unity and continuity develops. It's more an achievement than something that, um, uh, seems, to, that seems to come with the territory. Uh, your question about scientism, um, scientism, of course, is a dirty word, and so uh, I think it's, uh, um, I, I would like to change the terms of the debate. What I'm looking for is a consistent worldview. I think one of the characteristics that most of us have as rational beings is a search for consistency. And we search for consistency because otherwise you start thinking about one piece of your knowledge and you run up to the edges of it and you start thinking about another and you get contradictions and you don't really know what to think. So consistency is in, uh, uh, an extremely important ingredient in having a rational understanding of the world around us. I take theological knowledge very seriously. I take scientific knowledge very seriously. And since I, both, uh, since I think both of them are talking about, are, are giving us true accounts of the nature of reality, uh, it's very um, uh, unsatisfactory when they give us opposite accounts of something as important as the nature of human beings. And as I was saying in response to Dale's questions earlier, uh, the job of the theologian is to evaluate and reevaluate Christian teaching. And when we come to a point of conflict, um, it may very well be the case that theology not only does give, but should give, because we go back and look at our own tradition and find, gosh, we were wrong. And I think that's exactly the case in uh, the discussion about dualism and physicalism. All right, well, I had a, a couple of questions here. Um, my understanding of theology is that you're supposed to take uh, myth mythicism and all that and mix it with modern day science to come up with a theology of how things exist. Is that correct? You're supposed to take the stories and, and uh, um, belief system 
that people have and mix that with the hardcore science to come up with a, with a theology of how things are supposed to be. Is that correct? Well, um, in the Christian tradition, the, the primary stories are the biblical stories. Mm -hmm. uh, so yes, but it's not merely a matter of mixing. Uh, it's a matter of, it's more a matter of synthesizing, I would say. Okay, then, um, my, then more on to my, to my question. Uh, Near-death experiences, when they've done this, when they've uh, had uh, equipment around, you generally find that these people have no continuing brain activity uh, after the point of death, yet they still all seem to have this uh, experience. Um, and then on top of that, we also have ghost stories where for hundreds of years, uh, the same thing seems to be happening over and over again. And when equipment is taken in, uh, I'm thinking of a particular castle in England, they find higher levels of electricity in the air. Why would this come across as a soul if, or why would after death experience exist if the soul can't, the soul and body are not separate and able to separate from each other? Um, have you, how do you take that? <laughs> Take How do you that. handle them? Take that, Casper. Uh, <laughs> well, whenever you're doing either theology or science, you're always looking for the best theory that will fit the most of the data. And when you set out, if you, if you can't find a theory that explains absolutely everything, and nobody has yet, probably never will, one of the things you have to do is evaluate the significance or the strength of the various data, as well as the quantity. And it appears to me that the, uh, the sorts of phenomena that you're adducing here are of the most questionable sorts in terms of um, uh, empirical reliability or verifiability, and uh, those are also um, no, uh, that's also a, a very small range of data compared to the vast amount of data that's available that leads in a physicalist direction. So uh, one simply um, ignores anomalies when there uh, are good reasons to do so. Um, what about the fact that these are consistent? Uh, the the after-death stories around the world are consistent, and the ghost stories around the world are pretty consistent. And doesn't consistency lead to reliability? Uh, <clears throat> I just don't think that, uh, I, I don't find the, uh, that very persuasive sort of evidence because it's not the sort of thing that is amenable to uh, um, measurement. No, that kind of evidence is more important to you then. Pardon? That kind of evidence is more important, the kind that is measurable. Yes. But yet you referred to, if, if I got you right earlier, to certain kinds of religious experience mm -hmm. as an important kind of data theologically. Yes. And those are, would you want to say those are measurable or uh, in the same sense? Well, there, uh, uh, in terms of quantity of data, um, uh, there certainly are a lot of ghost stories, uh, but in the number of ghost stories that one hears compared to the number of accounts of uh, some sort of religious experience, uh, I think the magnitude is quite different. And um, for one thing, I've had religious experience of my own, and so I have first-hand experience of that. And I think that there, uh, across traditions, or within, with, within a given tradition, uh, there do turn out to be some uh, fairly strong consistencies in patterns of religious experience. And so while it doesn't uh, measure up uh, at all to the sorts of data that you have in physics, uh, the, both the quantity and the consistency do make it something that I think needs to be paid attention to. Uh, I'm interested in your comment about measurement, measurement and rationality because to some extent I think religion deals essentially with non-measurable but very important things and rather than value free puts a tremendous importance on value as beyond the sort of supposed value freeness of science and I think the value for me, the importance of blending science and religion is to bring back the sense of values to science that it lacks and to appreciate the importance of non-rational phenomena in understanding the organization of the universe. I think it's interesting that, for instance, there was a sense that we had to 
justify theology to science rather than justifying science to God. Could you perhaps comment on the importance of a non-rational and mystical sides of religious experience in understanding science? Um, I don't think I have a very clear idea about what is being referred to when people talk about the non-rational. Um, there are certainly okay, many... Okay, for example, Amazing Grace. Okay. Um, there are... Uh, there's much in the universe that is irrational. That is, rationality is a term that applies to knowledge or belief or argument or whatever. And receiving grace is not receiving an argument. So I would say that's, that isn't rational, it's irrational. Uh, nonetheless, uh, why is it not possible to talk rationally about grace? Uh, so I, I simply don't see the, the sharp division between the rational and the irrational. Well, division, no, but the sense you cannot talk about grace so much as you receive it or reject it. And the act of receiving and rejecting is essentially a, an emotional position, I think, not a rational one. Okay. Um, well, uh, one of the earlier questioners asked if I was promoting a scientific agenda, and uh, I would certainly say, no, I'm not. I'm not saying that uh, uh, the whole of knowledge is scientific, the whole of life is to be rational. Uh, it's just that I uh, uh, don't have occasion to talk about that which goes beyond uh, rationality since I came to talk about science and theology. So I think I want to endorse what you're saying, but I don't feel that I have anything further or very intelligent to say in response to it. Okay. Dr. Murphy, the previous questioner to your right, one of the previous questioners, asked you uh, where does one's sense of identity, one's sense of, of I, or one's sense of self come from? Uh, and you suggested that it comes from spatial and temporal continuity with our body. Uh, you quoted your friend who says, uh, one person, one body. But when we started this lecture series some months ago, Dr. Oliver Sacks talked to us about people who had had huge disconnections in that sense of self, uh, particularly uh, the classic case that's well known of Leonard, who uh, was afflicted with some sort of sleeping sickness that I don't think has been uh, entirely explained to date. But he did essentially fall asleep as a, a, a child and woke up some 40 years later in a body that had continued to grow and mature as he slept in a body that he did not at that point recognize as his own and in a place and in a time that he did not recognize, yet he knew that he was Leonard. So this breaks essentially your friend's statement of one person, one body. Leonard knew himself in two bodies in the course of his life, and yet he knew through that discontinuity that he was Leonard. So where uh, did Leonard's sense of I or his sense of identity come from, if not from some soul that was separate from his body? Well, I said in the, in the normal case, one person, one body. And there certainly are those um, aberrant cases that, uh, where the person's own sense of self uh, is problematic due to memory lapses or whatever. But um, um, personal identity is also socially constructed. If I have amnesia, for instance, and no longer remember who I am, the people around me still know that I'm Nancy. And it's uh, very helpful to them that my, my body does have that spatio-temporal continuity. So, um, uh, it's an interesting question, where does the sense of self come from? But I don't think anything of uh, great metaphysical import hangs on that. Question, question upstairs here. Oh, upstairs? That's okay. I can't see that, that's any okay. of you, so. Sorry, I, I, I didn't know there was a microphone up there. I apologize. That, that's all right. Go ahead. Uh, two questions. First of all, in your own worldview, how do you define terms like, and specifically, faith and intuition. How do they function uh, in, in your theology? And my second question is, what do you think will happen at the end of time? Okay, um, I think the, the uh, 
the term faith gets used in lots of different ways and it's often just used as um, uh, to refer to things that I believe but without adequate evidence and uh, so I take it on faith that so-and-so is going to meet me at uh, five o'clock when he said uh, I think that's probably not the uh, sense in which you have in mind. I think the, the down-home sense of faith in the Christian tradition uh, comes closer to the notion of commitment. Um, and so I think that faith plays the same role for me as it does for uh, dualistic Christians. Uh, it has to do with whether one commits oneself to the uh, teaching and life of some religious tradition, and in my case, uh, Christian. Intuition, I, I really don't know what that means. I don't have any definition of it. Uh, again, it's used in many different ways in different uh, philosophical writings. Uh, I've never pursued it, but it's never seemed to me that there's any common core there. Um, maybe the closest I could come would be to say it's the word we use when someone uh, leaps to a conclusion but can't reproduce the steps that he or she went through subconsciously in order to get to that conclusion. So in your theology then, I think there are many people in, in the, real, the real world, if you will, who, uh, as opposed to the academic world, who... <laughs> <laughs> Point well taken. <laughs> who uh, are not nearly as polysyllabic at times, and, um, <laughs> and who intuit their faith. They intuit their faith. Uh, I think this is why some people, in particular people who apparently sit in the orchestra section of the building, are, uh, are highly uh, charged when it comes to what you offer as theology versus what they intuit as theology. And, uh, and so, is there a role for that view of how to, to uh, relate to the universe that, that you in any way uh, can relate to, again, using terms like faith and intuition, in terms of coming to conclusions? Or do, are these conclusions purely from a scientific standpoint um, indefensible? Um. I'm not entirely sure that I understand your question, uh, but uh, let me see if this helps to answer it. Um, and I'll, I'll speak autobiographically. Uh, I'm interested in giving a rational reconstruction of what um, my brand of Christians think. And so I'm looking very hard for uh, various sorts of evidence. I'm looking for rational consistency and all that sort of thing. But as I, as I point out to my students in class, uh, no matter how many hours we spend in our philosophy of religion classes and no matter how hard we work at trying to give uh, an account of why what we believe is rationally justifiable, we're never going to reach complete justification or complete rational support for what we believe. Um, and so faith in the sense of commitment is what comes in to make up the difference between what we can show rationally and what we commit ourselves to, what we give ourselves to in a sort of 100% way despite the lack of 100% evidence for it. Um, well, I guess I'll just stop there and ask if that addresses your question. A absolutely, very well said. And I'll take a brief answer to the end of time question, too. Okay. Um, uh, as I said just very, very briefly in my lecture, um, there are uh, some views of the end of human life that see us as somehow extracted from the rest of the universe. And I think a much more consistent way of thinking about what's going to happen at the end is that it's the end of um, physics as we know it. That is, the entire uh, created order is going to be transformed in some way that we really can't talk about sensibly or rationally. Uh, mainly what we know about is what lasts in terms of human values. Uh, we can't talk sensibly about the kind of uh, physical or quasi-physical or transformed physical state in which those values are going to be um, uh, preserved and lived out. OK. Uh, All right. During the end of your lecture, you discussed uh, what 
many Christians in Judaism and other religions believe about what happens after the death of the human body. And I was just wondering, as a doctor and uh, as a deep thinker, what you personally believe happens. Um, I think uh, that I simply cease to exist after I die. That is, the body slowly rots away and eventually is gone. But as I was saying in response to the previous question, at the end of the history of the entire universe, the whole thing is going to be transformed. I will be recreated or restored, not in the physical body of the physics of today, but in some sort of different form, still recognizable as um, a body because it's the body that's required for social interaction, for community, etc. But the particulars we really can't talk about. Okay, thank you. There's a person that's been here for some time. Uh, for for a consistent uh, worldview, a rational worldview, uh, you have some particular explanation for miracles such as walking on water or uh, reconstitution of a of life after post-mortem changes? One of the topics that I've spent um, uh, a great deal of time thinking about is the nature of divine action. And uh, there are two extremes that I try to avoid in my thinking. One is a deistic view that God really never does anything uh, in the midst of creation once it was created and got started. The opposite extreme is to see God as um, overriding or intervening in the laws of nature. And so I've spent a lot of time trying to think about whether you can give an account of divine action that both countenances special divine acts of that sort, but also doesn't require us to um, see God as violating the laws of nature. I'm not po quite sure that that's possible. Uh, I'm also at this point not sure that there's any pressing intellectual need to say that God doesn't contravene the laws of nature. Well, uh, I, I would say there is because so many people are turned off and become skeptical because of those claims that you lose a lot of people to uh, the value of religion because they throw it out with that. Yeah, claim. that's true. I think there have been um, way too many claims for mir miraculous events in proportion to the number of divine acts that have actually taken place. And so uh, a sort of um, caution and modesty, I think, is required in making claims to have uh, uh, to have witnessed a miracle. You're quite right. Okay. With the premise that truth is harmonious and consistent with itself and with ultimate reality, isn't it quite likely that true science and true religion have no quarrel with each other? I think it, I, I hope that's the case, and I think that I think ultimately that would be the case so long as uh, humans have adequate conceptual resources with which to deal with the issues. So, for instance, physics is never going to tell us anything helpful about the uh, state of matter after the the end of the world. Uh, simply, we don't have the um, um, suitable conceptual resources for doing that. You haven't read Tipler's book. <laughs> <laughs> Have you read Polkinghorne's book, Reason and Reality? I've read quite a lot of Polkinghorne's work, and I've uh -huh. heard him speak quite a lot. Thank you. Okay, we have, I believe, two here, three here, and one here. So how about this one? Um, I was wondering if you have any explanation for the experience of knowing something's happened without being there. For example, my grandma died, and she's in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. And I was here, and I knew before anybody told me or said anything that she died. Do you have any way to explain that? Uh, I see no reason to think that God doesn't often tell us things like that. I um, expect to get information that I need um, uh, by means of, of um, uh, divine intervention. I don't know if there are any other sorts of uh, means by which things like that are communicated, they, we certainly wouldn't know what to say about them in terms of science if there are. Okay. In your discussion of the various texts of scripture, you seem to bypass several that talked about uh, Genesis 1 and 2, where it talks about you coming from the dust of the earth, but also the breath of life. The ecclesiastic is re reflecting on that. 
the body goes to the ground from which it came, the spirit goes to God from which it came. Paul in 2 Corinthians 5 speaks of being absent from the body and being present with the Lord. Uh, those kinds of texts, Jesus speaking, fear him who destroys body and soul, not him who destroys body but not the soul. Uh, these seems to speak to some sort of interacting dualism. You correctly refuted the Cartesian absolute dualism, but you didn't speak to an interacting dualism where the two are very closely related to each other in life and a family of texts. I'm curious how you relate to those family of texts. Well, each of those texts is different. Uh, the Genesis uh, text, um, God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils and he became a living being. That's often been interpreted as God putting a soul into the otherwise dead body, but uh, that's, um, uh, it, it's very easy to see that as reading body-soul dualism back into a text where it, re it really wasn't there. Um, uh, the Matthew text that you that you quote, uh, fear those who can destroy the, um, don't fear those who can merely destroy the body, but de fear him who can destroy the um, psyche in hell. Uh, in interestingly, the parallel to that in the other gospels doesn't talk, is, is not dualistic. It says fear uh, something like, uh, fear him uh, who has ultimate um, control over your life. I, I'm never really good at quoting scripture. So some of those texts have non-dualistic readings. Uh, some of them just s sit there as anomalies. But remember, I didn't say that the New Testament teaches physicalism. I said th that the New Testament draws on uh, a strange mixture of different accounts of human nature and uses it for making teachings about other things. So if there are writers in the New Testament who do presuppose a dualist account of the person, that still doesn't mean that one is necessarily committed to being a dualist. Another line here, it sounds to me as if in your re uh, review of the material that you showed that a uh, brain is necessary. I'm not sure you showed that the brain is sufficient. You mentioned Roger Penrose, who makes a similar argument from a, a scientific perspective, arguing that consciousness cannot be explained Mm -hmm. on a purely physical perspective. I'd be interested in how you respond to that line of thinking. Yes, notice that I said that physicalism pushes us in the direction, of, or neuroscience pushes us in the direction of physicalism. There's no way that, it, that neuroscience can prove that there's no mind or soul there. It's just that if you see mind or soul as arisen in the, having arisen in the West as a hypothesis to account for the human capacities that it did not seem possible to attribute to matter. It's gotten to be a hypothesis that we seem less and less to need. Or another way to put it is it seems more and more ad hoc to say, uh, yes, the, uh, the brain is obviously involved in these cognitive processes, but uh, brain processes are just uh, finely and strangely correlated with certain mental processes. In your lecture, you explained the concept of will from a physicalist per perspective, but um, to me, that doesn't satisfy the, the question of morality. If your will is composed of your brain, um, then what? How would you explain the ability of an individual to make one choice over another and, and have free will rather than just will uh, from a physicalist perspective? Yeah, that's a really uh, interesting and important question. And in fact, I'm uh, intending to work on that in my next book. Um, I, wouldn't, I don't mean to say that the will is, is composed by the brain. I would say that it's the brain that gives us the capacity to act willfully. Um, the next issue is the distinction between reductionistic and non-reductionistic uh, physicalist views of the person. If you're a reductive physicalist, then you're assuming that the laws of neurobiology will ultimately be sufficient to explain all human behavior. And if we assume that the laws of science, once we get above the quantum level, are deterministic laws, then that really does mean that there is no such thing as free will. 
So it's very important to make the argument for non-reductive physicalism as opposed to reductive physicalism. And I'm not even going to try to do that tonight at 9.30 uh, because it's a, a, a very difficult philosophical question. But I do think it can be done and will be done in the not too distant future. Excellent question. Thanks. Thank you. Can I ask one more question? Um, and that is that, are, are you saying then that neurophysiology, the field of neurophysiology, does not rule out the idea of the soul? That's right. It makes it seem less and less um, um, necessary, but could, ne could never prove that it doesn't exist. Okay, thank you very much. One last question. Okay. Um, central to the Christian belief is the idea of the indwelling of God in the believer. And I'm wondering where, in the physicalist view, God is going to be. Uh, is he still independent of us? Uh, I mean, dualism says that our spirit and God's spirit tend to work together and become more of a unity. But where does the physicalist come out with that discussion? Well, I think it's been, um, uh, I, I think the notion that God is imminent as spirit in the whole of creation uh, has been a pretty standard part of Christian teaching all the way back. And if God is imminent in or present in uh, the physical creation apart from me, there's no reason that God can't be present as spirit within me, even though I'm a physical being. It was handy to say that the soul was the locus of uh, God's presence. But uh, God's presence is not, um, uh, God is not prohibited from being present in any of God's creation, physical or whatever. It's just a matter of finding him. I don't know that, I mean, how do we prove that? And we get beyond the Enlightenment project and where do we find him? How do we prove him? Doesn't that go beyond the scope of the inquiry? Well, there, uh, I, how do we prove God exists is uh, one sort of question. How do we find God within us? That's a very different question. And a, a physicalist finds God within her the same way a dualist does. Uh, I, if I might be permitted, a very brief last question that connects with that. Uh, there's there's uh, some persons, uh, some theologians, Christian theologians I'm aware of, who have tried to speak about uh, either the universe or the earth as somehow God's body. Are you prepared to talk about mm. in those terms at all? I think that's an unhappy metaphor because, first of all, it depends on a dualist view of, uh, you know, the metaphor is based on um, physical body, non-physical uh, immaterial part, and so it would be rather awkward for me to be using that metaphor. I think it's also theologically problematic because I think the Christian and Jewish doctrines of creation have been leaning very hard against notions that somehow the physical universe is a part of God. Um, 